Good evening, Mr. Evans here with chapter four of our book, The Sugar Creek Gang by Paul Hutchins. It felt mighty good to be carrying that big fish home for Pop to see, although I kept wondering what Mom would say about my wrinkled overalls. They were pressed so nicely when I'd gone away. But Mom was as good a mother as Pop was a father. She was standing in the kitchen doorway when I came up past the barn and the garden carrying my big black bass and the fishing pole and the bait can. Pop was washing his face and hands in a big wash basin under our grape arbor, which ran along the side of the garage. He straightened up with soap suds all over his face and neck and looked me over from head to foot, and then his eyes lit up proudly while I held up the fish for him to see. Pop was looking at the fish, and Mom was looking at my soiled overalls. It's wonderful, Pop said. They're terrible, Mom said. I didn't have a chance to be either glad or sad now, did I? But I was worried some just the same, because I didn't want to make Mom feel bad. I'll wash them myself, I said to Mom. He won't need washing, Pop said, only cleaning and skinning. Meaning the fish, of course, not me. Just then the telephone rang, and Mom had to go answer it. So I had a minute to be happy about my big fish. Pop brought a ruler and measured it. Ten and one-half inches, he said, and gave me the other half of that hug he'd started to give me earlier in the afternoon. Right away, supper was ready, and as soon as I had washed my face and hands and combed my hair, I wet my hair a lot, too, before I combed it so it wouldn't look like I'd gotten it wet going in swimming. We sat down to supper, me still feeling kind of heavy around the heart on account of my overalls, even though I was cheerful as anything on the outside and as hungry as a bear on the inside. Mom's big, soft brown eyes kept watching me all the time. We all bowed our heads quietly before eating, and, hungry as I was, I kept my eyes shut all the time Pop was praying, which wasn't very long, for Pop knew how hungry a boy could get at mealtime, and most any time, he having been a boy once himself. Oh, Pop was a real Christian, all right. I knew that, not only because he prayed and read the Bible and went to church, but also because he acted like one towards Mom and me and everybody else. I was just itching to tell them the whole story about how I caught the fish, that is, how Dragonfly and I caught it. But I couldn't on account of not wanting Mom to know I fell in the creek. But pretty soon when Mom was waiting on the table and was pouring a second glass of milk for me. She reached down and kissed the top of my head just like I was a little boy, and she whispered in my ear, Don't worry, Billy boy. I know you didn't do it on purpose. And then she went around to her chair and sat down again. After that, it was the easiest thing in the world to talk. Pop laughed and laughed and wiped his eyes over me and Dragonfly falling into the water. That night, after I'd scrubbed my feet good and gone up to bed calling good night at the top of the stairs, I stood beside my bed a long time before getting down on my knees to say my prayers. Looking out the window at the moonlight shining on the barn and the garage and the new garden. I could even see the little top green tops of onion sets in long rows across the garden. Then I looked up at the Milky Way stretched like a big white bow across the sky and at all the thousands of stars. And I just kind of felt that God had made them, and I couldn't help but be glad I had a real pop and mom who loved him and tried to teach me about him. Somehow I couldn't help but think maybe he was like my mother and father, only more wonderful and a lot greater. He had made an awful pretty world, and he must have liked boys a lot because he'd sent his own son down to earth to be a boy himself once. I knelt down and said my little poem prayer, and then added some words of my own, which I can't remember now, and I felt just like telling Jesus I loved him, like I did my parents, and maybe even more, but I was scared to. But I did love him just the same, and I guess he can hear a boy's thoughts anyway, the same as his words, only it's better to use real words when you can. I tell you, that nice clean bed felt good, even if it was hot. And the pillow was so big and soft, only, only, why it was wet. 
No, not much, but it's like someone had sprinkled a few drops of water on it. And that's how I found out I'd been crying a little bit. I hadn't known it at all. I sighed a great big happy sigh, and the next thing I knew, it was a morning. Chapter 5 Say, that was the finest morning you ever saw. The big red sun was just peeping up over the horizon like he wasn't quite awake yet and hated to get up. The birds were singing like everything. Right up in the top of our big walnut tree which grew on the other side of the garden and where we had the biggest swing in the whole neighborhood and where the gang liked to play was a robin a hollering for all he was worth. Jasper Collins, get up, get up. I liked robins though, even if they did call me Jasper. And down on the ground, with his head cocked on one side, listening for a worm or something, was another robin with his red breast shining in the sunlight. He must have seen a worm all right, for all of a sudden he turned like a flash and was pulling at something with his big black and yellow bill. And sure enough, in a second there was a big long fishing worm in his mouth, twisting and squirming like it was on a hook. You know, it really doesn't hurt fishing worms to be put on a hook, Pop once said. Pop is a sort of scientist farmer, and he said something about it being just a minor irritation or something, which means it doesn't hurt much, kind of like a boy getting his neck and ears washed with soap and water, when he'd rather wash them himself by swimming and diving in Sugar Creek. Pretty soon that robin flew up into a fork of the walnut tree where there was a whole nest of little quintuplets waiting for their breakfast. Think of eating worms for breakfast. Worms. I dressed in a hurry, because today was to be the big day. Right after dinner, the gang would all get together, and Poetry would tell us what he'd found in the hollow tree down by the haunted swamp, and we'd all arm ourselves with our bows and arrows and slingshots, and with a big club for little Jim, and the fun would begin. First thing, though, was getting through the morning, which would be awful long because of all of us boys helped our folks in the mornings. That was Big Jim's rule. I guess there never was a boy that liked to work, unless he could imagine his work was play. But Mom had been trying to teach me ever since I was little that work came first and then play, and I guess she was right. Then, too, if you really love your parents, you like to do things that make them happy. I helped Mom wipe the dishes, which most boys think is a girl's job, but it isn't when you don't have any girls in the family. I finished raking the lawn, built a fire, and burned all the dead grass and leaves, gathered up all the tin cans and things that had somehow had gotten scattered all over the barnyard, mainly because I'd been using them for imaginary golf balls. I dropped the potato slices with the eyes in them in, into the long, deep rows Pop had made across the garden, stepped on them with my bare feet so they'd be pressed down into the dirt better, and would grow quicker. Maybe you think that wasn't fun, feeling the cool, damp dirt oozing up between my toes. Pretty soon it was dinner time, and we had fish for dinner. What kind of bait did you use to catch this bass? Pop asked. And I said between mouthfuls, mouthfuls, having a hard time to eat slow on account of having to meet the gang at one o'clock. Why just plain worms? Why? I just wondered, Pop said. I, I found a nice little chub on the inside of him. A chub is a small carp-like fish, you know. And the little chub was full of fishing worms, Pop added. I looked up surprised. That meant that first I'd hooked a little chub and then the big bass had come along and had swallowed the chub. Right away I knew what kind of bait to use for bass the next time I wanted to catch one. It'll be all right to fish for bass today, Pop said, looking at Mom and winking, and you won't run any risk of getting arrested. What? I said, kind of scared. The bass fishing season opens today, Pop said. If the game warden had seen you catch that one yesterday, it would have been too bad. Well, at ten minutes to one, I was ready to go down to the spring where the gang had agreed to meet, it being Thursday, and we always met there on Thursday afternoons at one o'clock, if we could. I ran upstairs to get my binoculars, thinking maybe we'd need them. 
On the way down again, I stopped to fasten the strap around my neck, and all of a sudden I went numb all over. Pop had the radio going, listening to the new news. And just that minute I heard the announcer say, Warned to be on the lookout for a man suspected of being an account plus in a bank holdup. It is believed he is hiding somewhere in the swamp. I couldn't make out where, because there was a lot of static. He is described as having black hair and eyes, and... When I got downstairs and looked at myself in the mirror, I was white as a sheet. But I hurried out of doors quickly so the folks wouldn't see me, and ran as fast as I could through the woods toward the spring, my heart beating wild because of what I've heard, and because it looked like maybe we were going to have a chance to help catch a real bank robber. Chapter 6 I was the first one of the gang to get to the spring, and Circus was the last, having had a hard time to persuade his parents how important it was not to miss a meeting. Circus's folks, his pop especially, never did understand boys very well, although his pop must have been a boy once himself. But grown-up people are funny that way. They kind of forget that inside a boy there is something that just makes him want to keep his promise to the gang. And I tell you, it's pretty hard to give in and obey your parents when they don't understand. But we had to, though. Big Jim said he'd read it in the Bible just as plain as day. Children, obey your parents. Little Jim, who wasn't any relation to Big Jim at all, only he had the same name, said it was true because he saw it in the Bible with his own eyes. Besides, Big Jim said, if you ever want to become a Boy Scout... One of the qualifications is obedience. Well, pretty soon we were all there. Big Jim had a mysterious package under his arm. Circus climbed a small el elm sapling almost as soon as he got there and was swaying in the top back and forth, looking every bit like a monkey in the zoo. Dragonfly and Poetry and Little Jim and I started tumbling around in the grass like kittens having a good time. All six of us boys as tickled to see each other as if we hadn't been together in years. The spring, you know, comes bubbling up out of a hole in a rock at the bottom of a steep hill, only about 20 feet from the creek. Pop had had the water tested to see if it was all right, and it was. Just that minute, a gr big green shike poke came flying up the creek, with his long neck sticking out in front of him like the long handle on my green coaster wagon, and his long wings were flapping and driving him through the air re awful fast. A shike poke is a real green heron, Pop says, but it's the most idiotic-looking bird you ever saw. I had just gotten my binoculars focused on him, and was following up the creek with my eyes when poetry was reminded of a verse from Hiawatha. And away he went in a squawky voice, which was about as squawky as the big quilk herons, which goes quoking up the creek at night, sounding like a young rooster learning to crow, and being interrupted by another one with the same kind of voice. Then the little Hiawatha learned of every bird its language, learned their names and all their secrets, how they built their nests in summer, how they hid themselves in winter, talked with them whenever he met them, called them Hiawatha's chickens. Poetry finished the first verse and started the second, when something came swinging down from up above somewhere and landed right on top of him. Circus having caught hold of the top of the elm sapling where he was sitting and swung himself out, and the top of that tree had bent right over to the ground and brought him down with it. When he let go, the treetop flew right back up again. Excuse me. And in another minute, we were all trying it, each one climbing a tree and swinging from one to another or down to the ground, whichever we wanted to do. You can do that with elm trees, you know. But all this was just wasting time, so pretty soon Poetry looked at me and I at him, and we decided to ask Big Jim to call a meeting so he could show us what he'd found yesterday. First, though, Big Jim opened his package, and there was a whole packet of paper drinking cups. We knew right away what they were for, 
because we'd studied in school about how everyone ought to have individual drinking cups for health reasons. Big Jim Pack picked up the old rusty cup that was standing there on the rock, and which everybody in the country had used for years, maybe. And we all stood around solemn-like, wondering what he was going to do. First he held it up for us to see, and then he said dramatically, making a play out of it, You can never tell when someone is going to drink out of it. Someone who has some terrible disease, maybe. And then the next person who uses the cup may become infected. Then Big Jim set the cup down on the rock, and with another rock he pounded and hammered it until he'd smashed it all flat. Then he tossed it into the weeds, and pretty soon we had a sign up which said, Please use paper drinking cups. When we were finished, those cups were fastened up on a tree by the spring in a little tin container, just like you see them in the cities or in streetcars or in most any public place. All of a sudden, poetry was gone, and then a minute later, he came hobbling down the hill like an old man, with a long beard and long white hair and with dark glasses on. Dragonfly pinched me on the arm so hard I couldn't help but say, Ouch! And then I shut up like a clam. Howdy, boys, poetry said in the quavery voice of an old man. Do you reckon maybe a feller can get a drink of water at the spring here? Little Jim White looked as white as a sheet for a minute. Circus's monkey face was as sober as a funeral. Dragonfly and I were holding our hands over our mouths to keep from laughing. I thought even Big Jim looked a little bit worried, for he was a boy even if he was our leader. He wasn't so much bigger than poetry at that. "'Where's my old rusty tin cup?' Poetry's voice quavered, and it didn't sound any more like poetry than anything. But Circus saw his bare feet and noticed how fat he was, and a second later Poetry was standing bareheaded and looking surprised and disgusted, and Circus was already trying the disguise on himself to see how he would look. Well, Big Jim called a meeting, and Poetry and Dragonfly and I told them everything we knew, even to the radio announcement. Big Jim took it all pretty calmly, but I could see he was as much excited as on, on the inside as the rest of us. Maybe I'd better run home and ask Mother if I can go, little Jim said. Not much you don't, Circus said. It's going to be a secret, of course, if you're afraid. I'm not afraid, little Jim shouted bravely. Of course, he was afraid, and so were all of us. But a boy likes to be scared a bit. It feels good. So pretty soon we were there, right down along the swamp, walking cautiously toward the old hollow sycamore tree. That is the end of chapter 6, and I will see you again tomorrow night. Have a good evening.